I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Janice Rock from McGill University. His talk today is titled, Extracellular Oncogenes as Biological Effectors and Biomarkers. Janice? So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this, uh, this session. I, uh, I'd like to share with you some of our interest in, um, in extracellular oncogenes, but um, as I, I titled my talk a little bit more broadly, but the main topic will be uh, related to um, mechanisms of extracellular emission of oncogenes as cargo of extracellular vesicles. With this clarification, I'd like to also, um, um, uh, before I begin, um, acknowledge some of the some of the contributors to the work that I'll be presenting. Of course, without without the contribution of people listed uh, on this slide, nothing of this would ever happen. These are the current members of my group. These are the former members of alumni, and these are our valued collaborators who contributed in various ways to our uh, work and, of course, the granting agencies that uh, made it all possible. I, I would also like to mention, for, in the interest of transparency, that I am a co-inventor on a patent describing the use of oncogenic microvesicles um, uh, for, in cancer diagnostics, but otherwise I have no conflicts of interest of any kind. Um, so I would, like, I would like to frame my presentation around a, a, a hypothesis or, or premise that uh, a particular type of intractable human tumors, glioblastoma, uh, but also many others, they may represent a, a paradigm of um, pa pathological connectivity, uh, w w which is why they may be somewhat so incalcitrant uh, in the context of therapeutic approaches, but where may also be some novel uh, therapeutic and diagnostic opportunities. And so in the other words, um, the topic of my presentation is going to revolve around what happens uh, between tumor cells, um, not, not necessarily within each and every one of them. Um, so the paradigm that I chose to um, to explore today is is, is glioblastoma multiforme and, and and the visual um, inspection of, of cross sections of these tumors gives, gives one a sense of, of cellular complexity, which is sort of embedded in the name of, of the disease and shown in this image where the multiple types of cells, some of which stain for astrocytic markers in brown, uh, such as GFAP, some don't, coexist in a, in a, in a, in a tumor and, and in close proximity, necessitating some sort of interrelationship between these cells or possibility of interactions both between the tumor cells and also with vascular and inflammatory components which are very much present in, in, in the stomach multiform. And of course, one can reason that each of these cells has its own intracellular circuitry which predisposes these cells to engage in certain forms of interactions. And, and I would argue that there's very little we actually know about the nature of these interactions. And I think some of the things that we are interested in aim, aim at understanding this in, in, in some more detail. Um, so among many interactions one can consider in the context of the glioblastoma, what I chose to, to use as an example or a paradigm is interaction between glioblastoma cells and the vascular system. And the reason why this is something that I find particularly attractive is, is the fact that there's some very obvious and visual uh, or visually apparent uh, manifestations of these interactions. So vascular system in, in, in um, local sites where glioblastoma arises in the brain is profoundly altered in, at multiple levels. This includes hemorrhages, uh, uh, vascular proliferation or angiogenesis, hypertrophy, uh, vascular, intravascular thrombosis, and many other events that define this disease in both uh, cellular and also diagnostic and, and functional terms, which I think is, is in some ways very, very telling as, as this disease is actually among the most vascular tumors uh, that are known in, in human medicine. So, and, but they also manifest, these, these, these images, they also manifest the, the, the ability of tumor cells to extract or communicate to, to host cells certain messages that that uh, change the functionality or state of, of, of those cell, cell compartments. And, and uh, this is even more profound when one looks at the, at the systemic range of interactions that glioblastoma may exert uh, 
And this is striking simply because uh, these are local tumors. They never uh, metastasize to distant local sites. There's few cells in the periphery, and yet glioblastoma can exert profoundly disturbing or perturbing effect on peripheral vasculature, leading to high frequency of deep vein thrombosis. For example, in, in vascular locations that are meters away from the original tumors and occur with double digit, digit frequencies in glioblastoma patients, causing significant morbidity, and the nature of these interactions is still relatively poorly understood, but with the possible involvement on sort of circulating extracellular vesicles or microcarticles containing tissue factor or potentially other effect or me mechanism. Um, so one interesting um, contention or, 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 or point here, I guess, is that um, all these vascular events, all these extracellular or intercellular events, occur on the background of increasingly well-defined genetics of the Yodosoma multiforme, whereby several uh, driver events have already been identified and described in some details where the, the, the dominant role is ascribed to um, uh, promoters of telom uh, mutations in the promoter of telomerase and as well as high frequency of amplification or oncogenic mutations of, of epidermal growth factor receptor, which occurs in between 30 to 20 percent of, of all patients. So, 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 so there is, there is then this intracellular circuitry superimposed on these intercellular interactions. And of course, the question that arises what is what are the interrelationship between these, these facets of, of, of tumor progression and, and whether they could offer some, some, some important intervention points or diagnostic opportunities. And so, so this has to do with a wider question, uh, which is, how, in, in general terms, uh, oncogenic driver events can uh, instruct or change, or whether, in what ways, can they uh, change the non-autonomous effect um, uh, within uh, during tumor progressions? In the other words, what are the consequences or non-autonomous effects that oncogenic drivers can exert uh, in cancer? Um, this uh, notion that um, oncogenic transformation can, in fact, alter extracellular environment uh, can be illustrated in a, very, in, a, in a very simple experiment, which may involve, uh, for example, uh, indolent glioblastoma, which we have some years ago engineered to express a glioblastoma-specific oncogenic uh, uh, mutation, that being EGF receptor variant three mutant genes, and, gene, and, and this resulted in a dramatic change in the phenotype of these cells from an indolent or dormant phenotype to a, an overtly and aggressively tumorigenic state. And, and these changes um, were interestingly linked to a number of events that have very little to do in inner workings of, of tumor cells themselves, but, but uh, impact um, their interactions with the vascular microenvironment. For example, cogenic mutation of EGF receptor variant 3 drives uh, a strong upregulation of vascular endothelial growth factor as well as tissue factor and interleukin-8, these factors being um, involved in angiogenic procoagulant or inflammatory responses that are associated with glioblastoma progression. And indeed, in this case, arguably, uh, the oncogenic mutation is, um, can be viewed as a trigger of multiple um, uh, interactions with uh, different facets of extra, extracellular or vascular uh, uh, compartments that, uh, that accompany uh, tumor progression. Um, so, so this interface is driven from within, but but is expressed uh, in a form of interaction between tumor cells and the, and the vascular vascular environment. And and of course, we don't understand fully what are the mediators of these sorts of interactions. And I would argue that we, as a field, have become very comfortable with um, molecular interactions involving. Uh, receptor ligand systems in, in, in a variety of configuration as, as either autokine, trastokine, paracine, or other forms of molecular interactions. And, and, and the frontier in this respect is are interactions that are a little more complex in nature, involve physical contacts between different interacting cells and different structures or sub supramolecular structures that mediate mediated interactions such as tunneling nanotubes microtubes, gut junctions, and, and of course, extracellular vesicles that may act over longer distances and, and, and basically detach some of the molecular cargo and transfer it to, 
to recipient cells. Um, so, so these are non-conventional pathways of, of, of um, um, it's also so interaction. And, and, and the question is, to what extent and what is the role in, in changing the, um, uh, the phenotypes of, of cells engaged in these, in these interactions? And, and what does this have to do uh, with the state of cancer cells transformation or differentiation stage that these cells may exhibit? And, and just to give you a sense that these are consequential processes, I just want to use one example of a cancer cell type, which is, which is one of many. Um, in this case, this is a epithelial cancer cells expressing oncogenic epidermal growth factor receptor. Indeed, this expression drives a strong upregulation of this procoagulant receptor called tissue factor, which then is shed from tumor cells as a, as a cargo of extracellular vesicles. And of course, these cells continuously interact with endothelial cells, and the question is what would be the consequence of interaction between these vesicles and endothelial cells, knowing that endothelial cells are programmed for anticoagulant or coagulation preventing phenotype rather than, than procoagulant phenotype that tissue factor would engender upon tumor cells and other cells. And it turns out that uptake of vesicles from cancer cells actually changes or overrides this, this anticoagulant default in such a way that endothelial cells uh, are visibly affected, so they uptake fluorescent dye associated with vesicles, but also they change their phenotype from anticoagulant to procoagulant, and this is enhanced further by inducing epithelial to mesenchymal transition in, in these cancer cells. So this is a very real transition in a phenotype which is solely mediated by extracellular vesicles as an example that this is a powerful influence that can really change cellular phenotypes. And indeed, in glioblastoma, there's a very good evidence um, for a number of years now that the glioblastoma cells, either primary cells or cells that have been cultured for a fairly long time in, in, in a dish, they, they do exhibit structures on their surfaces that, that um, um, would, could give rise to extracellular vesicles or, or resemble uh, extracellular vesicles. And, and of course, these structures can, all, can not only be found in culture, but also in in tumor cells in vivo, for example, in this case, this is a xenograft of a tumor expressing EGF receptor variant three oncogene, and one can find uh, structures between tumor cells which may resemble or may represent extracellular vesicles being produced. Um, in addition to the fact that glioblastoma cells produce vesicles, these vesicles are often are abnormal. So this is a study that was uh, published by uh, uh, Dr. Sharma using uh, atomic force microscopy. And of interest is the fact that while well, normal astrocytes produce round extracellular vesicles of, uh, with a regular shape, um, their, tum uh, their tumorigenic counterparts from, from glioblastoma cells produce vesicles with nanofilaments attached to them, and therefore they are structurally uh, different than those from, from, from normal uh, astrocytic cells. And of course, this raises um, an, another level of discussion, which is uh, glioblastoma is not a single disease. It's a collection of diseases that are defined by several types of oncogenic pathways, several previously mentioned oncogenic events, and of course, several transcriptional profiles that distinguish between different subtypes of the disease. And the question is, do these molecular events have any impact on the nature and capacity of glioblastoma cells to produce extracellular vesicles. And so, so, so what is the impact of oncogenic pathways on, 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 facets, on facets of cellular vesiculation? In what way do oncogenes, if they do, impact vesiculation processes of cancer cells in glioblastoma and, and, and beyond? And of course, there's, there's an emerging literature that there could be multiple effects that oncogenic transformation may exert on the ability of cancer cells to produce extracellular vesicles and use them for inter inter intercellular communication. So in, in, in this case, for example, there are three selected um, uh, studies from the literature. In one case, uh, what is shown here is that mutations of KRAS oncogene and superimposed mutations of the P53 tumor suppressor gene, which is mistakenly shown in, in white, it should be, uh, should be read drives the expression of or emission of vesicles containing tissue factor 
in a progressive sort of fashion, whereby the increasing level of malignant transformation leads to increasing emission of tissue factor as extracellular vesicles. But even a single step uh, on cogenic transformation, such as here, for example, by expression of, of just one, one oncogenic region, in this case, HRAS oncogen, is capable of driving the expression of exosome-sized vesicles by transformed cells and also shifting the profile of these vesicles towards more uh, towards smaller and, and, and more exosome-like uh, uh, vesicle subtypes. And, and finally, uh, in the case of oncogenic EGF receptor variant 3, uh, the increase in vesiculation profile is manifested by greater protein loading into the vesicular output of, of these glioblastoma cells, once again suggesting that that oncogenic transformation can, in fact, profoundly change how the how tumor cells vesiculate, what kind of vesicles they make, and what what, what, in, what is the output of this material from, from tumor cells affected by oncogenic transformation. Of course, there's many other examples of that kind of linkage. So oncogenes have been linked in a variety of ways to, to changes in the profile of vesiculation. Those, those include KRAS oncogen, T53, different mutant forms of EGF receptor, MIC, um, TML, RARA, oncogenic leukemia cells, some of the oncogenic microRNAs, and so on. And in many instances, this is an increase that is observed after expression of these genes. In some cases, there's a decrease, but nevertheless, in, in, in virtually all cases, there's some form of change that oncogenic pathways exert upon vesiculation profile of, of, of cancer cells. And of course, the question arises, why would that be? So what is what is uh, what is the nature of the link between oncogenic pathways and, and this and this phenomenon of change in vesiculation by, by cancer cells? And the simplest way to think about this is to simply consider what we know about regulators uh, or intracellular modulators or, or effectors of different vesiculation pathways. For example, um, involved in formation of membrane microvesicles or exosome-like smaller vesicles, or in, in fact also bona fide exosomes. And, and so we know that these processes, um, um, which are still not fully understood, involve a number of molecules that fall into several different categories, some of which are GTP exchange factors, some of which are uh, RAS-like um, proteins, for example, of the RAP family, uh, some of which involve escort system um, molecules or membrane proteins, um, which all of which have a role in production of different types of vesicles by, by cells. And the, and the question arises whether or not the levels of these molecules are simply unspecific and common between different cancer cells and normal cells, or do they actually reflect the transformed or oncogenic status of tumor cells? And once again, I would like to resort to some of the analysis we've, we've conducted with uh, glioblastoma, or as I mentioned earlier, disease can be subdivided into several molecular subtypes, including mesenchymal, classical, neural, and proneural subtypes, each of which driven by its own repertoire on cogenic or driver mutations. And surprisingly and interestingly, the, the levels of different effectors of vesiculation is not the same. It's actually dramatically different in many cases. For example, in mesenchymal glioblastoma, the, there's a high, uh, highest level of RAP27A regulator and, and for example, in proneural subtype of glioblastoma, uh, single, neutral single malignant is, is expressed at much higher level than in other subtypes of glioblastoma. Therefore, one can argue that oncogenic pathways intersect uh, with, with um, um, uh, the circuitry that is responsible for vesiculation of cancer cells and shapes the, uh, the content or, or, the, or the mechanism uh, still to be discovered of the tumor cell uh, vesiculum. Um, perhaps, so this, uh, I, I guess, illustrates to some extent that there is, in fact, a linkage between oncogenic transformation and vesiculation pathways, but in, in, in my personal opinion, the, the, the deepest link lies in the fact that um, vesiculation is responsible for, for emission of, of oncogenic macromolecules themselves. And uh, we know that, that exosomes and other types of extracellular vesicles that don't need to be described to this audience. The, the, the topic has been covered many times over. Um, they, they are highly diverse in, in terms of their molecular cargo. They contain numerous proteins, surface protein, tetraspinins, and, and other content. But, and, and, and 
they may share similarities between different subtypes, but, it, but one aspect of cancer cell vesiculation that is absolutely unique to cancer cells and not found in any normal cells is, is the fact that some of these molecules emitted by cancer cells are actually structurally abnormal. So in fact, they carry the very same oncogenic mutations um, that drive uh, the function of these genes within parental cells and, and by, by which these vesicles can be uh, unmistakably distinguished from, from vesicles emanating from normal cells. So, so this, is, this, is, this uh, uh, emerged uh, early on from, from our own uh, efforts uh, where two members of my laboratory, Khalida Al-Nadawi and Brian Nichols, have been experimenting with a number of EGF receptor expressing or non-expressing uh, cell lines, and they found that while um, um, cells transformed with oncogenic EGF receptor VN3 or harboring endogenous EGF, uh, oncogenic, oncogenic EGF receptor um, um, uh, where they, these cells can be found to express these genes within the cell lysate, uh, so too could be extracellular vesicles r related or derived from these respective cell lines, thereby suggesting that, in fact, this, this particular type of oncogenes uh, can not only be found within the cell interior, but can al also be exteriorized in the form of extracellular vesicles and enter the thermal microenvironment. Please note that, that we, we have a very highly abundant uh, presence of mutant EGF receptor VN3 as a lower band, which corresponds to the truncating mutations that leads to activation of this receptor in, in, in the other stoma cells. Um, this is not a, a, a trivial notion, uh, at least in my opinion, simply because in glioblastoma, the presence of EGF receptor VN3 is almost never uniform. And in these tumors, the typical characteristic of these tumors is the coexistence of uh, EGF receptor VN3 expressing and non-expressing cancer cells, which creates an interface across which the positive and negative cells could, cross, could interact and share some of their molecular, molecular properties using extracellular vesicles and other mechanisms. And, and of course, um, oncogenic cargo has since been described in a number of different tumor types and includes a great number of different oncogenic molecules, including RAS proteins uh, or mRNA, MYC, EGF receptor VN3, beta catenin, MED, DRAF, and, and a number of other molecules, as well as tumor suppressors, which also exit cells in a form of extracellular vesicles. So this is a mechanism whereby tumor cells can regulate and communicate with other cells, potentially at least, um, by emitting these, these respective mutant proteins and, and nucleic acids. Um, so so the, then the question is, um, uh, since these mutant proteins can be found in the extracellular environment as cargo extracellular vesicles, what are the potential consequences? What, what, what is the fate or, or biological implicate, what are the biological implications of this, of this phenomenon? And, and this image is meant to illustrate that, that when one produces mixed tumors composed of uh, EGF receptor variant three expressing cells and their indolent non-expressing counterparts, one can find that the red fluorescence, which signifies the EGF receptor variant three itself, can be found also on membranes and within uh, cells that normally don't express this oncogenic protein and therefore suggest that some form of membrane material can migrate between positive and negative cells. And, and of course, that's of considerable interest given the transforming capability of this particular oncogene. And of course, one can approach this in a more direct way by using cell culture experiments, which are easier to quantify. And one can ask, what would happen to EGF receptor negative glioma cells if they were exposed to extracellular vesicles emanating from, from cells positive for this oncogene? And one finds that these cells become positive for immunoreactivity against this oncogenic protein. In the other words, they acquire the expression of this molecule, at least temporarily, as a result of their contact with uh, vesicles containing the, this material. And this can also be visualized by direct immunofluorescence. Now, what might be the implications of that particular interaction? So in the other words, do extracellular oncogenes traveling across the intercellular space as cargo of extracellular vesicles, do they have an impact on cells that may uptake this material and and what which we call recipient cells. And, and this experiment shown here is meant to illustrate that uh, 
first of all, at least a fraction of extracellular EGF receptor variant 3 found in vesicles from glioma cells is, is, is in a phosphorylated or activated state. And the uptake of this material is capable of triggering some of the canonical events that one might expect to occur downstream of, of activated EGF receptor, in this particular case, um, phosphorylation of uh, MAP kinase, but also some other events, such as phosphorylation of AKT pathway, as well as biological responses, such as growth, survival, and onset of angiogenesis. So indeed, these oncogenes that find themselves in extracellular vesicles outside of the confines of their parental cells may possess biological activities. And one example of these biological activities is what I would like to describe as sharing of the angiogenic phenotype. As I mentioned earlier, these indolent glioma cells um, uh, that we work with, they possess very little ability to express vascular endothelial growth factor or trigger angiogenesis. And yet, when these cells are exposed to extracellular vesicles containing EGF receptor variant 3 oncogene, they now acquire, as I mentioned earlier, the expression of this gene and also the ability to trigger on their, their own expression of VEGF as, as depicted here by VEGF promoter activity assay, which shows that an increase in, in VEGF gene transcription of, uh, in a dose-dependent manner as these cells are exposed to different quantities of variant 3 receptor containing microvesicles or exosomes. Uh, so, so the angiogenic phenotype can be shared, and this may potentially explain some of the, the paradoxical observation one can, one, can, one can see. So several years ago, we had performed an experiment in which we essentially produced either uh, uh, transplants or xenografts of the indolent parental cell line, which, as I mentioned earlier, is dormant and doesn't form tumors in mice, or the, the variant harboring EGF receptor variant 3 oncogene, which, as, as I mentioned earlier, is highly aggressive and, and tumorigenic, or the mixture of the two. And one would expect that the mixture of these two cells should produce an intermediate phenotype. And this is not what we found. We found that, in fact, the mixture produces an increase, albeit a, a modest increase in, in the tumorigenic capacity of these cells, which one might attribute, although there is no proof of this at the moment, that is it results from the interactions between these cells within the tumor mass. And indeed, we can, we can infer some of these interactions somewhat speculatively from, from analysis of signaling events within either transformed or indolent cell populations, the latter of which exhibit some level of MAP kinase activation in the presence of transformed uh, or EGF receptor, ex, ex, uh, mutant EGF receptor expressing cells. Um, another dimension of these cells interactions is what I mentioned earlier um, occurs between tumor cells and, and, and vascular cells. And one can argue that um, emission of transforming oncogenes in the form of extracellular vesicle cargo could impact um, endothelial cells and act as, a, as an unusual or unconventional tumor angiogenic factor. Um, to examine this possibility, we have um, uh, many years ago set up co-culture experiments or, or uh, vesicle transfer experiments involving donor cells containing oncogenic forms of EGF receptor variant 3 and endothelial cells. And these experiments revealed that endothelial cells are very capable of uptaking EGF receptor, uh, oncogenic EGF receptor um, and expressing their, an their respective antigen. And also, they respond to this presence by activating the canonical pathways expected to lie downstream of this, of this particular pathway. Uh, and, and these are not inconsequential events, as endothelial cells, um, in our hands at least, uh, began, begin to, try to express some of the angiogenic factors, such as VEGF, that they normally endogenously don't express, and also they exhibit activation of VEGF signaling pathway within their own midst suggesting that, that the presence of this or, or exposure to vesicles containing EGF receptor variant 3 impacts the in, 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 intracellular signaling or, or responses of endothelial cells themselves. And many of these effects could be inhibited using a variety of tyrosine ty kinase inhibitors, in, including inhibitors of EGF receptor variant EGF receptor itself, but also uh, VEGF pathway and so on, but not Avastin, which acts extracellularly to to, to endothelial cells. 
So whether or not this effect is meaningful in terms of regulating tumor responses and, and angiogenesis, of course, requires further, further study. But, but what, what we have done some years ago, we, we have used one of the known inhibitors of excess, excess cell vesicle uptake called dianexin, which is a dimer of annexin-5, to basically treat mice uh, harboring GF receptor-driven tumors and, and, and ask whether or not this treatment would actually translate into any therapeutic effect. And indeed, we observed there was a tumor growth inhibition in this case with, with, with this relatively um, uh, innocuous agent, and, and also the tumors exhibited a lower my, microvascular counts, suggesting that, in fact, this treatment exerted some degree of anti-angiogenic activity, perhaps through blocking the effects of vesicles on, on endothelial cells. And, and, and this is a viable area of investigation, which is now flourishing with many agents that are capable of blocking uptake of excess cell vesicles by a variety of cells, and also there, there, are, there, are, there are very interesting ideas out there to, to inter interfere with, with the effects of these vesicles on target cells or, or with mechanisms of vesiculation that give rise to formation of these vesicles and their emission from cancer cells. And I guess the, the, perhaps one of the most tantalizing, or, or at least from my perspective, interesting question in this whole um, area is, is the fact that, after all, uh, we are dealing with uh, extracellular presence of transforming molecules. And, and one could reasonably ask whether or not this, this situation would lead to the, the possibility of a horizontal transfer or full-blown transformation of, of cells ex exposed to this material. And, of course, we early on analyzed this question in some detail and using, for example, what is considered to be a, a, a gold standard assay for cellular transformation, the soft agar, agar code information assay. In this assay, um, uh, we have observed once um, EGF receptor via 3 containing vesicles are incubated with indolent glioma cells, these latter cells acquire an increased ability to form um, soft, uh, colonies in soft agar, which is viewed as, a, as, a, as an equivalent or, or, or indication of their, malignant trans, of their malignant transformation. But of course, this is not, uh, this is not a, 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 an observation is tantamount to over transformation of normal cells. Um, however, the literature um, brought several examples or, or listed several examples of, of, of experiments or studies in which uh, some degree or, of, of tumorogenic conversion of recipient cells has been observed upon the uptake of different types of extra of, of, of vesicles containing extracellular oncogenes, including apoptotic bodies, exosome-like vesicles, and, and, and other types of um, uh, mechanisms transferring the cargo between the cells, including the, the, the direct contact between tumor cells and and and, and, and stromal cells. In all of these cases, different cargo was implicated as transforming activity in different recipient cells, many of which viewed as normal, have been shown to, un, uh, to acquire tumorogenic phenotype. And so so this, this was an issue or is an issue of considerable interest because if indeed such a transfer of horizontal transformation was to take place, this would fundamentally challenge some of the key tenets of our present understanding of, of uh, uh, tumor progression. Of course, this kind of question requires or is worthy of, of some analysis. And this, this question captured the interest of one of my graduate students, Tae Hun Lee, who undertook the corresponding study. So what, what Tay reasoned is that it, it is more likely, it is less likely that horizontal transformation would occur uh, with the help or with the transfer of oncogenic RNA or oncogenic proteins, simply because these, these particular molecular forms of oncogenes are short-lived and they would become either degraded or diluted in, 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 during the progressive growth of recipient cells, but, but, but the, the greatest chance of this kind of event to occur would be in the case of transfer of oncogenic DNA. And of course, one would want to use oncogenic DNA with very potent transforming activity, and in his case, he chose to use oncogenic HRAS. And we happen to have an access to uh, uh, an experimental system, which in, in many ways is, is very conducive to these sorts of studies, because it consists of essentially uh, phenotypically normal epithelial immortalized cell uh, line called, called IEC-18, and, and derivatives of these cells, 
um, transform with RAS or, or SARC oncogenes. And what is particularly attractive about the system is that parental cells are completely non-tumorogenic over extended period of time. They never give rise to tumors upon injection to, to mice. And in contrast to this, the RAS transformed counterparts are violently tumorogenic in mice giving rise to aggressive tumors within a matter of two or three weeks, um, essentially leading to experimental and clinical endpoints. So, so they decided to look at the system and simply ask the question, can we play the tape, so to speak, in reverse? So can we, for example, take extracellular vesicles from cancer cells and render parental cells transformed? And um, for this, he would need to know whether or not, in fact, these cells produce vesicles, and they do, and whether or not they contain RAS, these vesicles contain RAS in its relevant molecular forms, and, and the answer was yes, they do, including uh, um, the content of HRAS DNA um, in, in this material. So, the, so what was interesting about this particular observation is that oncogenic RAS seems to be a driver of the entry of genomic DNA into extracellular vesicles simply because parental cells produce vesicles in, in um, uh, some numbers, but these vesicles had no content of, 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 of DNA, uh, of cellular DNA, whether, whether it's RAS transformation, uh, while maintained or even increased the viability of cells resulted in entry of, of DNA sequences into extra vesicle, extracellular vesicle cargo. And of course, we sequenced this material and found that uh, the content of these vesicles contain not just RAS, but the entire spectrum of genomic sequences covering the whole uh, genome of these cells and contained histone DNA complexes as well as full-length RAS sequences, which were, would be required if we were to test the transforming capability of these, of these vesicles. And, and so they were, the vesicles from, uh, from RAS transformed cells were then incubated with parental IEC-18 cells, and the result was completely unexpected we have absolutely seen no signs of transformation. In fact, IEC-18 cells became, exhibited a, a form of resistance to the uptake of, of extracellular vesicles in that they were in, unable to, up, to uh, absorb or incorporate significant numbers of these vesicles that were, with which they were incubated. And this was also a property of completely unrelated normal human astrocytic cell line, NHA. Now, this resistance, which would normally constitute a barrier for horizontal transformation of these cells by extracellular uh, vesicle associated oncogenes and was completely disrupted when these cells became transformed with either using either transfection of SARC or RAS oncogenes into them or by spontaneous transformation of uh, normal human astrocytes, which upon uh, such transformation were now capable of, of uptake of extracellular vesicles containing RAS. And so the level of transformation is depicted in these in these coniformation assays and showed the transition from an, a non-transformed to a transformed state, which was then paralleled by the uptake of sex extracellular vesicles, suggesting that oncogenic transformation facilitates the uptake of extracellular vesicles and lack of such transformation constitutes a barrier for horizontal transfer of transforming genes. However, when we looked at cells of other origin, especially mesenchymal cells such as fibroblasts, all of, all of those were capable of uptaking vesicles without any signs of transformation. These are all cells that are very susceptible to oncogenic transformation, and even without such transformation, they take up uh, vesicles very readily. Therefore, uh, we decided to test whether these cells now may be more susceptible to transformation by, by uptake of oncogenic grass through excess of vesicle-dependent mechanisms. For this, we use another classical assay for malignant transformation, namely the false formation assay, whereby cells are grown to certain confluence and, and exposed to vesicles and, 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 and foci three-dimensional growth patterns are counted in the, in the resulting cultures. And the results initially were very dramatic. When we exposed the, these fibroblastic cells to extracellular vesicles containing grass, uh, there was an increase in colony formation that was you know, orders of magnitude above any background and, and very robust and long-lasting up to 22 weeks. We observed uh, 22 days in culture we observed robust colonies. Um, however, the subsequent uh, uh, continuation of this experiment uh, led to a, a very surprising outcome, namely the number of colonies or foci uh, began, to, uh, began to decline, and, and subsequent passages of cells isolated from the foci showed absolutely no 
uh, the capability of foci formation. Similarly, initial, initial passages of foci forming cells were capable of retaining mutant extra sequences, and their subsequent passages lost this, this content, even though the, the, the early passages were, were um, derived from cells that were in culture for, for uh, something like 36 or 40 days. So consequently, the conclusion from this experiment is that while some suscept transformation susceptible fibroblasts can undergo transient uh, transformation like state, this state is not lasting and, and, and eventually dissipates um, and while the RAS sequences being transferred become lost from the cells if through a mechanism that we, we are now investigating. Uh, another experiment that was meant to examine this even further was an experiment using very high concentration of extracellular vesicles, reasoning that perhaps we can increase the chance of, of, of integration of RAS sequences into the recipient cell genome. And yet, in this case, the effect was, was, was paradoxical in that high concentration of extracellular vesicles from RAS transformed cells exerted a, a toxic or detrimental effect on recipient cells, while vesicles derived from, from normal cells or non transformed cells did not have such effect. So extracellular vesicles can have a, a, to a toxic effect on recipient cells, and this constituted yet another barrier for horizontal transformation, whereby exposure to high concentration of this material does not enable the cells to survive. We also explored the, the properties of non-immortalized or primary cells, such as endothelial cells, which are natural recipients of vesicles circulating in plasma. And in this case, we observed that while endothelial cells in culture were stimulated by by, by addition of, of vesicles containing RAS oncogene, this effect was not, was not permanent and eventually dissipated without any evidence of long-term transformation of these cells or, or retention of, of viable cells over a long period of time. And finally, we decided to examine this, this, this question in, in, in vivo, in, in mouse experiments, whereby um, um, transformation susceptible fibroblasts such as RAT1 cells were pre incubated with extracellular vesicles containing RAS oncogene um, and, and injected into mice, or they were mixed with RAS3 or RAS transformed cells, in which, uh, which were um, rendered uh, unable to divide through treatment with mitomycin C, and, and several of these fibroblastic cells were co injected with RAS cells into mice, or finally, Mitotically inactive RAS cells were injected directly, uh, aiming at transformation of uh, host cells with, with the material that these, these RAS cells would contain and emanate over a period of several weeks. And yet again, no evidence of tumor formation beyond the background was observed, suggesting that both in vitro and in vivo transfer of oncogenes um, between cells has a, a, a profound a transient effect on the, on, the, on the phenotypes of recipient cells. And, and this conclusion is, 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 in fact, could be predicted or is consistent with, with what we know about um, the patterns of progression in human cancers and an as, as, as assumption that uh, uh, horizontal transformation would, would render normal cells um, uh, tra fully transformed or would, would lead to full-blown tumorigenic conversion of these cells is would be inconsistent with the fact that, uh, that, that human tumors are largely uh, mono-oligoclonal and, and horizontal transformation would result in polyclonality of these tumors would also, um, this kind of phenomenon would also um, um, impact the histogenesis of tumors. We know that primary melanomas give rise to, to metastases, which are also histologically uh, similar to melanoma and do not involve transformation of distant cells, and finally, the phylogenesis, genetic relationship between different clones within tumors, which is, can be beautifully mapped with lineage tracing experiments or sequencing experiments, would also not be possible if horizontal transformation was a frequent event in human, in human cancer. Um, so, so rather than assuming that horizontal transformation converts or oncogenes convert normal cells to cancer cells by integration of other mechanisms, uh, we would like to propose that these onc oncogene-containing vesicles exert profound regulatory effects, whereby they connect different subsets of tumor cells and, and 
control their mutual relationships or uh, or, or, or or abundance in the, in the tumor and 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 influence the, uh, the mutual behaviors, be it invasive growth or, or angiogenic, uh, in in the in the progression of, of different tumor types, including uh, glioblastoma. Uh, these are obviously uh, the questions that require enormous amount of additional work and, and, and the role of exocell vesicles in regulation of tumor growth or progression is a subject of studies that I'm sure will continue uh, much into the future. And, and of course, they constitute an interesting um, new dimension in, in our attempts to, to find new intervention points. However, uh, in a more immediate way, uh, the, the, the content of normal or mutant uh, macromolecules in exocell vesicles presents itself as a, as, a, as a very attractive diagnostic platform in cancer. We stumbled across this several years ago when we analyzed blood samples from mice harboring EGF receptor variant free glioma tumors and found that uh, these uh, samples contain detectable amounts of uh, EGF receptor variant free protein uh, contained in isolates of extracellular vesicles circulating in, in blood of these mice and, not, and, and this signal was completely absent in the tumor of free mice. And of course, this, this line of investigation has now been beautifully developed by a number of, 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 of laboratories who worked with human material, especially glioblastoma patient plasma samples of cerebral spine and fluid. And this work was pioneered by uh, Sandra Breakfield's group and, 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 and it's now elevated to much higher uh, technological sophistication by, by uh, uh, Hako Lee and other investigators in Boston, but nevertheless, it presents the presence, presence of unique molecule presents molecules with mutations that are associated with tumor progression presents itself as a, as a promising for, way forward whereby one can diagnose molecularly these tumors using appropriate uh, technologies. And one area where this investigation could be of particular interest is the field of targeted therapeutics where several drugs can be developed to target mutant proteins or transforming proteins, sometimes in a very specific way, or target their corresponding signaling pathways responsible for malignant transformation. And indeed, one can argue that the paradigm for this kind of analysis is, again, epidermal growth factor receptor against which there's a number of uh, agents that have been developed and some of which are being clinically used uh, to inhibit various functions of this transforming oncogene of which um, and the, the irreversible second generation inhibitors such as camertinib or atomtinib constitute an, a very interesting class of experimental agents that can be used to analyze the, the, the consequences of EGF receptor kinase inhibition in different tumor contexts. And so we, we have taken interest in this question, especially Laura Montermini in my laboratory, and, and decided to, to survey some of the tumor xenografts for, for the expression of extracellular vesicle associated phosphor oncoproteins in plasma of tumor bearing mice. And indeed, one finds that, that many of these uh, oncoproteins can be detected in the phosphorylated form in vesicular cargo of, 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 of mice harboring these different xenografts that are corresponding to different types of human tumors, as well as in cultures of, my, uh, of, of cell lines um, um, from which vesicles can be isolated and analyzed for different phosphoprotein uh, signals. And of course, even, with the, even the, the seemingly simple question focusing on one oncogenic receptor is not, is not as simple as one might expect, simply because epidermal growth factor receptors is a complex molecule containing several phosphorylatable phosphotyrosine sites within its cytoplasmatic domain, each of these sites uh, responsible for different functions of this receptor and different in the in activation of different signaling uh, cascades that this receptor is capable of, of interacting with. And, and the question now arose whether or not uh, these different phosphorylation events respond similarly or differently, and whether the cells and vesicles are similar or different with respect to their phosphorylation profile when either left untreated or when treated with some of the signal transduction or receptor or EGF receptor inhibitors, such as, for example, this compound I mentioned earlier, CI1033. And as you can see from this image, in fact, there, 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 there are differences between vesicles 
and cells with respect to the content of phospho EGF receptor, including different phospho isoforms of this receptor, in that extracellular vesicles retain and perhaps serve to emit some of the isoforms of EGF receptor up upon treatment of, with this tyrosinase inhibitor. Nevertheless, extracellular vesicles do contain uh, phosphorylation responses that, that distinguish uh, cells that are treated with these drugs versus cells that re remain untreated or cells which are exposed to stimulants of the EGF receptor, such as TGF-alpha. And therefore, one can argue that while this is not a direct copy of cellular responses, it is nevertheless an informative um, uh, line of inquiry where one can try and understand the responses to targeted agents by using, looking or using extracellular vesicles as a, as a, as a probe. Um, However, we, while, while doing these experiments, we, that being Laura, we came upon an, an interesting observation, that is, when we treat tumor cells har harboring oncogenic EGF receptor with, with some of these kinase inhibitors, the, 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 the content or the, or, or the, 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 the composition of extracellular vesicles changes in one especially interesting way, namely, these vesicles become uh, positive for, for genomic DNA. And, and, and this, this is not, these are not typical apoptotic bodies, but in fact, the DNA content is present within the cargo of vesicles of exosomal sizes. And therefore, one can argue that it may, it may be possible to actually capture these vesicles using EGF receptor as a, as a capture antigen and ask whether or not the content of DNA is, 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 can tell us anything about the responses of, of, of respective cells to the treatment with these targeted agents? And the answer is yes. In, in the case of two irreversible inhibitors of EGF receptor, um, we, we find that extracellular vesicles captured using EGF receptor antibody exhibit the content of DNA only if the cells have been treated with these respective inhibitors, suggesting that some of these principles could be used to develop assays that may tell us whether or not the drugs we use against these, these, these receptors with oncogenic molecules are working or not. And I think this is a, a small part of a much larger picture uh, that is being developed by a number of very uh, interesting research programs and, and, and which encompasses a great number of outputs that can be interrogated uh, using extracellular vesicles as a platform to, to understand drug responses and, and a variety of properties of the respective tumors. And, and of course, this is a, 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 the future that we all look forward. So, the, so, so the, to, to summarize my comments, I would like to uh, make a, a few points. Uh, first of all, in cancer, the pathways of cellular vesiculations are altered, as I argued, by oncogenic transformation at least at at least five different levels in a quantitative terms by changes changes in the output of extracellular vesicles per cell or their protein content in a qualitative way. By, molecular, by changing molecular composition of extracellular vesicles, their proteome and phosphoprotein, but by also by engagement of effector pathways involved in extracellular vesicles biogenesis or, or vesiculum, and by the very content of mutant genes or proteins within vesicles themselves, and finally by transformation dependent changes in the extracellular vesicle uptake by recipient cells. In glioblastoma, extracellular vesicles serve as intercellular carriers of mutant oncogenic macromolecules, and, and this includes protein, MR, proteins, mRNA, and DNA, um, which uniquely and profoundly alter the recipient cells and may, may be involved in, in regulation of tumor microenvironment, angiogenesis, vascular permeability, thrombosis, and many other properties of the, uh, evolving tumors. Uh, while this transfer has a, a, a fundamental effect on, on the phenotype of recipient cells, um, it, it is uh, uncertain at the moment, or requires further study, or may even not um, be the case that the transfer of oncogenic uh, cargo between cells uh, is capable of overt tumorigenic horizontal transformation, unless, of course, one invokes transfer of oncogenic viruses or, or epigenetic events that indirectly may impact recipient cells. Um, um, and of course, the mechanisms of, uh, of the, the, the uh, control the barrier functions that, that eliminate or, or, or restrict 
the effects of excess oncogenes on recipient cells, you know, remain to be remain to be studied. And in, in, in this context, um, uh, while we still uh, need to understand more about the uh, biological effect of excess cell vesicles in different tumor contexts and 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 the, and the role of the oncogenic cargo in that in that in that setting. Um, these, these vesicles serve as a, as a very unique and, and, and interesting um, and diagnostic platform where information can be extracted as to the composition of driving mutations, signature of responses to target agents, and potentially many other properties uh, linked to oncogenic um, um, transformation process. Um, so on that note, I'd like to Thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't, uh, I didn't go too much over time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Yeah, th this is uh, Bob Coffey. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, we've been actively pursuing uh, the role of mutant grass and its effects on composition and behavior of exosomes. And, I've seen uh, somewhat similar findings. Um, I did want to just call attention to a paper that was just published in Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, where we are using fluorescent activated vesicle sorting uh, to detect EGF receptor uh, on the surface uh, of exosomes. And we've actually done an experiment that I think is instructive, where we've put a colon cancer cell line, DIPI, into nude mouse xenografts, isolate the plasma, and then can show using human-specific antibodies that we can detect human EGFR in those circulating um, exosomes. So we're moving forward actively in that, in that area. Yeah, I, you know, that's a great comment. I, I'm, of course, you know, aware of your, of your important work, and I, I Perhaps I should have involved, included more material to this effect in, in the presentation. I just I just ran out of space, I, I guess. But but these are these are definitely very important experiments, and I think you know detection of these of these effectors in plasma I think is going to be very useful in in, in diagnostic and, and and therapeutic context. So thank you for your comment, Bob. Last call. Any any other questions? If no questions, uh, I think we'll uh, wrap it up. But thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.